This is Legendary Adventures in Legacy Code, um, in which we're going to talk about everyone's favorite topic, Legacy Code, right? So I kind of pitched uh, Paul on this. I'm like, yo, this is a DDD conference. But chances are some of the folks that are coming to this are working with portfolios that contain legacy code, technical debt, all kinds of things, and figuring out how to apply DDD. So um, brief introduction. Hi, my name is Dave Larrabee. Uh, you can, I'm on Twitter, at Larrabee. At Nerd Noir is probably the more interesting thing to follow. Um, we post a lot of like interesting articles that are at the intersection of art and science, technology and design. But uh, I'm an independent consultant. My company is Nerd Noir. Um, and so in that, I get a lot of opportunity to see all kinds of train wrecks of code bases and all kinds of issues. And I'm really there from coming in from the outside to help um, usually brought in by management, and by management, I simply mean people financing software. So when I use that term, kind of, you know, inject that macro um, to kind of assess code base, help a team kind of overcome some uh, issue around delivery, around, you know, delivery speed, uh, or, you know, decide whether or not we should rewrite it. And sometimes I'm kind of brought in to help figure out, like, what a sensible architecture or amelioration plan looks like. Um, so a little bit about me. So legacy code. What's legacy code? This is crowd crowd work. You guys answer. Tell me. Legacy code. Okay. What well, what's that? Code you, didn't write. code you didn't write. That's my favorite one. I mean, we kind of we can save some time. There's 130 slides in the stack. So code you didn't write. Sometimes I hear code without tests. Like that's the kind of feathers approach to it. But there's no guaranteeing those tests are any good whatsoever. Uh, what's that? You didn't write them, right? Well, I mean, you might have written the code, and then 12 months later go by, and you've learned a whole bunch of things, and you finally got through that big blue book, right? You know, and you're like, gee whiz, there's a new approach to writing software, and you're like, whoever wrote this can go suck an egg, but you wrote it, right? So I think I just kind of, legacy code doesn't really factor into my vocabulary anymore. I don't care. I don't care about technical debt. I'm over it. You know, I'm over the Twitter wars of 2010 about technical debt. To me, it's more a matter of feel. So I will say I'm kind of employing a Dungeons and Dragons analogy here. That's just to make it fun. Do not do this <laughs> when you take some of these ideas back to your uh, workplace. It's like a really easy way to be um, viewed as a crackpot. But I basically kind of put that in there just to kind of jazz it up a little bit and maybe bring some people that might not normally come to a boring legacy code talk. But from a developer's perspective, legacy code is really like mind bendy shit, right? It's painful to deal with. It's annoying. It's like you show up and you're like, eh, another day of this crap, right? And I think that's kind of, you know, it boils down to a few things. You know, we can look at coupling as, uh, you know, probably one of the top reasons, technical reasons you have uh, legacy code that is like, for example, and if anyone's kind of used jQuery extensively and then had to upgrade to a new version of jQuery, but all my shit is tagged like or totally coupled into jQuery, well, it can be a real problem. So that keeps you at a lower version. It's an example of that. Cohesion. I've got to go how many places to make one change happen in my system, right? That's a kind of tech, and there's, you know, mathematics behind this. Cleverness. I think about, like, the aspect-oriented programming riff that was happening, you know, kind of mid-2000s, point cuts, you know, and, like, you know, Everyone, when they discovered Ruby, were, was like, let's monkey patch this. Let's do metaprogramming. Let's create DSLs. And that's great until that person that created that and maintained it goes away, gets hit by a bus, some other kind of tragedy. Now, you know, now you're in this kind of un, uh, this, uh, unknown, known kind of area, right? Comprehensibility. Like, this is just the whole notion of whatever developer was here before me, chose some weird ass names. Like, uh, I'll tell you a story real quick, but some more of an anecdote, but um, he's working on a team and there was this notion of boundary in the software. But dude decided to call it Ambit. Ambit, anyone know what Ambit means? Well, obviously it means boundary, right? But I mean, like you can't control shift R, you can't uh, control, um, control N, you can't grep for that if you don't know it exists, right? So just the word choice is a little bit funky, right? Or sometimes you people, you know, lays out and they kind of, you know, pick temporary variable names and just kind of move on. So it's another area where developers can kind of experience debt. And then, you know, the big complexity. It's kind of arrowhead code, 
Uh, certainly we saw a lot of this with Node.js with callback hell before we got into promises and async await, that kind of thing. There's still problems with Node.js, but um, you know, where you kind of end up with lots of if statements and you have to figure out how to change a piece of code and you have to figure out where can I put my can predicate that won't jack up every other predicate in this giant chain. So in the description, I do talk about a 15,000 line class. That was the main issue with that class is complexity. There's some kind of supporting material as we go on. So we're going to talk about that throughout you know, our time together. But part of the message of this talk is we need to think about you know, janky code or difficult to maintain code or our systems or evolving our systems from the manager's perspective as well. Right? So a manager cares about a little bit different thing. And I'm not talking about your direct engineering manager again. I'm talking about people financing software. And they're thinking about things like time to market, ROI, net profit. What's the goal of most business is, is to you know, make money or save money, right? Income statement shit. Literal agility. And I don't mean kind of like the agile management fad stuff that's kind of played out. I mean literal business agility, being able to kind of pivot your system to a new opportunity, a new regulation, a new requirement, right? Sometimes we make choices that kind of box us in. And that can be kind of a source of legacy code. Mistrust. So when you have managers, and I work you know, a lot in like Global 500, um, and it's so crazy, because they're like, this team, you get 25% of your time to fix tech debt. They have no idea what that even means, right? They, it's just completely like, this 25% will make them, will, you know, will settle the uh, kind of the code monkeys down a little bit, right? But it kind of engenders this mistrust. And then turnover, I think, is an insidious thing. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that the average time spent in the software gig is like a couple years, right? Turnover is like, think about that mind flare kind of sucking that brain that, out of you and you, know, you show up. You're probably going to want to switch jobs after you've had enough. You know, just kind of like take this job and shove it. So that's a really kind of problematic thing, especially when we start looking at the world of complex domains. When you have someone come in, you train them up, they, you know, he or she understands what's happening with the software and is productive for a good 18 months, and then they decide they've had enough and move on, you lose all that tribal knowledge, you lose all that institutional knowledge, right? So I'm looking at kind of techniques that remove this discussion from like a zero-sum game. It's a little hard to see, this is Seventh Seal, uh, there, this is a knight during the bubonic plague in the 17th century playing against death. It's not going to end well for one of them. I'll let you guess who, right? And so I think there is a process or practice or negative feedback loop which leads to technical debt, legacy code accumulating to the point of crisis. Um, I'm just going to call it Doc Norton, the technical debt trap. He unpacks this. This is kind of a research thing. I could not find the original paper, uh, but I also did not go to the Wayback Machine, so I'm sure you can. But anecdotally, this supports my experience. So take it with a grain of salt. I'm not pretending this is science, but someone did the work to kind of map this. And what we're seeing on the x-axis is time, right? And on the y-axis, we're seeing kind of complexity or uh, workability or difficulty of working with something. So we see three curves, and I apologize, I know this may not be colorblind friendly, friendly, but on the bottom curve we have light gray. And this is, well, let's start with the top. The top is the black curve. That's like code like hell, waterfall, you know, let's get her done, um, just slam it in there, you know, a bunch of different people kind of owning it or, you know, people siloed to particular parts of a code base. On the bottom we have the gray curve, that's gray. The gray curve is um, what is agile engineering practices, which I will lump domain-driven design into because I don't see Eric Evans in the room. Um, but really, things like test-driven, all the XDDs, test-driven, behavior-driven, domain-driven, these are the kind of my bread and butter. This is, these are my set of sensible defaults that I tackle new projects with and look at you know, existing projects or compare them against. So the idea is that over time, and these, the bars are kind of more or less years, but units of time, over time systems hit a tipping point where they reach a point of crisis where a rewrite happens. Anyone ever been involved in a rewrite? Okay, now leave your hands up. Now um, put your hand down if that rewrite, you know, it, well, okay, never mind. Put your hands down. <laughs> put your hands down. Lost my place. Um, it's Denver. Uh, so, <laughs> 
So, you know, at a certain point, rewrites incur a lot of risk. I mean, there's second system effect. There's all kinds of things where it's rewrite plus. That's one. It's a client told me, it's a rewrite plus. Well, no, it's not really a rewrite then. It's not like for like. Or it gets really hard to figure out how to, you know, take a little a dance talk, how to take a piece, how to break a piece off and kind of that big ball of mud kind of get a strangler going, right? Get something that will replace that. So there's a lot of risk. So what ends up happening is management whoever's financing your software project, and talent negotiate, or, uh, you know, however that negotiation happens, that, you know, every quarter we're going to have a week of refactoring, a tech debt repayment week, right? And what happens is that's great, and you make some progress, and you clean things up, but then the delivery hose turns back on, and you go back to scramble mode, right? You go back to get your done, you go back to ship it, ship it, ship it, you go back to this imbalance of quality and delivery, right? And so you end up with a bit more of an effect that leads you to crisis a little bit closer. The other major problem I have with how we measure code quality uh, today, I, I have a lot of problems with you know the industry, but this for this today, um, I do not like these kind of skeuomorphic metrics. We're looking at code climate here. Uh, skeuomorphic metric is it basically borrows from some other concept. In this case, we're treating code as we would a student and giving that code a GPA. So we're looking at GitLab, a very nice product. I've used it in the past. Apparently, it's a solid B student, right? And this kind of enforces this notion of black box. So we end up with the black box. Engineering has no, or management has no clear understanding into the health of their code base, and they use bullshit metrics like code coverage to kind of say, here's our quality story, right? Um, they use, and you know, skeuomorphic metrics. So what I'd like to propose is a bit more of a multifaceted approach to code quality. So we're gonna borrow from a few things. Rather than go deep on one particular metaphor like tech debt, I'm gonna sample from a variety of metaphors. One is obviously kind of D&D role-playing games, but another one's design thinking. This is, uh, adapted from a thing called product personality. Um, I also do product coaching, and we kind of use a variant of this to kind of give your product a notion of personality to start a UX team gelling. But, you know, we could, <laughs> and I do fantasize about like crowdsourcing place and adjective and adjective to, you know, get that kind of childish Mad Lib fun. But for our purposes, I'll just kind of drive this. Our system is a dungeon. Changing our system is a scary, risky, threatening pro uh, prospect, but it's also full of reward. So when we think about D&D, &D, who's ever played D&D &D or a similar fantasy role-playing game, right? You go into the dungeon. Your objective is to face the monster, slay the monster, and get the treasure, right? That's the whole point. It's really simple. And you have fun and you kind of, well, the first couple sessions you generate player characters, but, you know, you kind of have, you have fun doing that. You're kind of st t telling a story as a group, right? Um, what I, and the reason I kind of use the scary and risky combined with the reward thing is I think tackling legacy code, although it seems like a drag, really builds a set of skills that you can take with you from project to project, from team to team, from product to product. Those are kind of first principle skills that let you cope and survive and thrive in a variety of different environments. So my, this is kind of, you know, again, dressed up for the D&D metaphor, but my general approach is um, these kind of five steps. First, I try to map the world, like try to just gain understanding. And that's strictly to prevent me from rushing to judgment, thereby d d you know, diminishing my influence. Then I try to tell a story, and I tell that story to kind of vet whether or not, you know, I'm, I've got a beat on what's happening with the system, right? And then people will correct me or get engaged in the storytelling process. Then I like form a party. So, you know, usually it's more than me. Maybe it'll be a mob. Maybe it'll be a pair. I'll be pairing with like a, some kind of senior developer, senior engineer. But we kind of, I have some thoughts about how you might uh, go and form a party. And then we adventure. Again, we're trying to take the, the the, the um, stigma out of legacy code, the annoying aspects out of it, and make it exciting, right, as we can. And then we retell the story. Really, five could just be go to one, right? So I'm going to take you through this kind of steps. And this is what I do. Of course, I don't present this as D&D &D to clients. They would just look at me like, what? 
dude, okay? One of those weird agilists that likes to play with Legos. Um, so, first step, map the world. Now, I'd say, you know, as developers and engineers, we kind of tend to get a little myopic and focus on just the code. It's the code, it's the code, right? It's our classes, our types, our aggregate roots, our boundaries, you know, our, our, uh, all, all that stuff, right? And I think, you know, when we start to kind of look through systems, we have to consider more than the code. There's a larger world at play, okay? So very, very simple thing, I think, in terms of mapping the world. Um, I like to kind of first consider where am I in the world? Where have I landed? Where does this system participate with other systems, dependents, dependencies? Um, who's working on it? Who has worked on it? Who will work on it? Um, basically taking a larger view. Anyone recognize this screenshot? This will tell you, um, so I'm probably one, um, okay, Maniac Mansion, 1984, Nintendo Entertainment System. It's a little disappointing because I spent hours playing this as like an eight or nine, say six year old, um, <laughs> nine year old. <laughs> and, you know, I'm like playing this for hours and hours, and it's like kind of, you know, it's got like a, a, a little language in there where you kind of verb object, like pick up probably that key on, on his left, he should pick up. But when you pull back, and this is what's kind of disappointing, and clearly was not the most precocious child, because this is the game. This is the whole board map of the game, right? But you're kind of working through the world. And the point of this all is a you know, fun retro reference, but the idea is think about more than just your code, the class. And it can be really difficult, especially if day to day you're in that kind of delivery grind, elevating and thinking about what surrounds me or what are the conditions that support or detract from the user experience of my code base. So that's one element, and we can certainly kind of just adopt that mindset, more of a worldview, more of a, a broad mindset. This is a fun little hack. Um, so who works in a big, big, big company? Like big, okay. Here's a hack you can do, this is fun. You can, make, you can use this to prove a point. This is something I like to do is figure out, well, to make this change happen, who would, be, who would I need in the room to kind of elucidate, get you know, information about the, why things have gotten to this point, how does it feel for you, what are your ideas, kind of just jam on it. I will go into Outlook and add all those people into a fake meeting, right? And then <laughs> with that fake meeting, I will very quickly uh, determine this is a large bank, that's all I'll say. Um, <laughs> And what it, would it take? Here I'm trying to schedule a two-day workshop on product discovery. So I'm basically screwed, right? So, you know, kind of enhance, enhance, you know, tell me what you want to do today. You want to give up. So this is kind of like coming back to the Conway Law notion, organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of those organizations. So an organization that is intensely, you know, what is it, the tyranny of the clock, right? Schedule-driven, outlook-driven development. Like an organization that works that way, what kind of software would you expect them to produce? I would expect it to be very disjointed. I would expect Git Blame to have lots and lots and lots and lots of people on any particular file. So this is kind of a notion of, understand the organization you're working for. If you're doing client work, how does that client, what is the modus operandi of that client, what is the communication style of that client? And that will give you some insight into why things have, uh, why you might be facing crisis or why you might be approaching limit of crisis. Okay. So we've got a new kind of worldview. We're looking at our organization. Um, another thing we can kind of look at, this should start any second. So this is a tool called Gorse, and Gorse looks at your Git log. So we're still not looking at code now. We're getting a little bit more technical. We're looking at your Git log. And what Gorse, you know, initially when I found this, I'm like, oh, wow, this is eye candy. This is really pretty. But I've kind of started to learn how to read the tea leaves of Gorse. And what you're seeing is like this old school team I was part of in 2009, XP team, domain driven design, like all the good things. And it shows a really good picture. It shows collective ownership happening. So the little, the edges of the graph, the node, node edges, like those are files. The zaps are commits. So you'll have, you know, a zap, you know, a series of zaps touch a bunch of files. That's a commit with multiple files, multiple hunks. Um, and the branches are folders, right? So it's pretty, pretty simple that way. 
And it's showing you a nice kind of story of like a code base that can go between releases. It can, like the, you know, management can turn down the heat or take people off of this code base. It's showing you collective ownership. But it's also showing poor Joe Allen up there doing all of the functional testing alone, right? So it's kind of giving me insight, like maybe we could pair a little bit more with Joe Allen or we're, you know, maybe functional testing could be flattened. If we're going for that real flat kind of um, development team, the XP style team, that's something that can happen. Another thing you'll see here in Gorse, it's super easy to run. You can run it against your code base, so I'd encourage you to go do that. You can see that this code, you can see Stephen Harmon, we hire him, and the way he, I, apparently when you hire Steve Harmon, what he does is he goes and refactors everything that's not up to his standards. He's a ringer. Um, but you'll see at some point on the lower right quadrant of this, you'll see it kind of break out. And that's um, showing you that there's a design change that's happening. This code can is capable, boom, of that kind of design change. And it's interesting. If you go to YouTube and type Gorse, there's a bunch. There's like, um, I think, Notch's uh, Minecraft. They show over two years, two developers writing Minecraft, like obviously unicorns, like crazy, but you could see them change their mind all the time and just crush it and, you know, they're making crisis part of their workflow. So we had a little crisis. The code is set up uh, to be able to kind of deal, that, deal with that. But this helps, tells you a couple things. There are, are client courses I can't show you where you see people stay in the same area, stay in the same area, and that's where you have kind of this, like, institutional knowledge bound up. Those are the Sherpas that you might need to involve in your party to say, hey, come help me out and explain why this is the way it is, let's, you know, help, let's get to deeper understanding on the human story and why this code is where it is. So mind, we have mindset, we have organization, we have what our kind of team approach is to our code, but we're using the log to get that. Um, and now we can start to look at some actual c metrics around the code. So end depend, one of the super slept on, I think. I think, actually, it's not slept on. I think a lot of people download Endepen, .NET. This is a .NET code analysis, static analysis tool. A lot of people download Endepen. They open it up. They look. They see this. They're like, ooh, heat map. They go deeper, and they're like, what the hell? Like, it's this crazy, it's got its own query language. You can write these kind of, you can write your own metrics, right? And so I'm using this a lot with .NET teams. In this particular example, this is the 15,000 line class, and it's the top row middle box. So what you're seeing here are the large boxes are namespaces. Um, the boxes within the box are the types or classes, and the coloration has to do with complexity. And you can set cyclomatic complex complexity. So it cuts through a class, right, or method. In this case, it's class. So number of pathways. So that will be determined by your conditionals. That will be determined by that kind of sort of thing. So you can set complexity threshold. What I've done here is set it to a ridiculous number, 64, which means a class that has over 64 will start to be more red than green. So that big red thing on the top, that's your core domain. In domain-driven design terms, that was absolutely this. This uh, company's domain was field service, and they're, um, they're probably like if you have like an aging parent or a grandparent, this would be the company that would come like mount their, else, their TV to the wall, right? We'll leave it at that. But they um, had this kind of work order, field order, uh, field service management application. That class on the top in the center is called work order. It's 15,000 lines, right? So that is the core of their domain. That is the core domain that they're dealing with. Now, 15,000 lines, you can start to go then parse and say, well, how many domains are actually buried in that one class? They had everything, persistence, logging, all the cross-cutting concerns and their security inside of that class. But it gives you a very clear vector if you want to start refactoring, if the will's there, to kind of go and start pulling it out. I like to mention this, too, because this is kind of a really cool thing, I think. Uh, Code, City, Code City, Richard Weddle, it runs a small talk, but you, it, yeah, I know at the very least you can use it for Java um, apps, and it still works. Um, but what you're seeing here are the blocks are really kind of your packages, and your buildings are classes that are either God classes or brain classes. So classes that are just like, I am the class, I am the only class, or classes that are doing a lot of the coordination, where you have kind of like inappropriate intimacy, you have those kinds of code smells. So now we can map with some high-level metrics. Now, 
The reason I put this in here, again, think about engineering and management, the people doing it, the people paying for it, you know? This speaks, this works all the time. It kills for me. I mean, a dozen times I've presented this to management and they're like, I get it, I understand. You know, this is a, a qualitative fact that you can embed in a story. Okay, so now we have mindset, we have organization, we have the team and how they're treating the code base. We have now looking at kind of wide kind of metrics that give us an overview of where um, this system is. And there are many, many other things. There's a few peppered in here, but I'm gonna leave it up to you. We can talk about it after. There are other techniques, but notice that we're going from kind of our worldview into where we're situated, why things might be that way, and um, kind of trying to understand you know, where the pain is and communicate that pain. Okay, so step two, tell a story. And I look at storytelling for influence. I think if we come at people with debate, as we often do in engineering circles, developer circles, we love debate. We love civil debate. I love going to lunch with developers and it's just like you just need Wikipedia open to solve, oh, well, that, let's end that argument because we can look up the facts, right? Developers love to debate, I'm one of them. And so a lot of what you're seeing here are these are techniques that I've built to make myself less of an asshole in the consulting world, which really doesn't fly. But I use storytelling kind of as a way to say, look, here's what I understand. Is that true? Right? I use that to kind of get people to involve, you know, or to add their narrative to this story. Um, now, a couple ways nonfiction can go. Obviously, you can go chronological. Here's why this happened. Um, you know, but I think thematic is kind of an interesting thing. I often ask people to describe the kind of debt they have, and it's interesting, or legacy code, it's interesting, they're kind of so beat down that they're just like, it's just bad. They can't really elucidate why it's problematic, what the experience is, you know, why are they having difficulties? Um, so I kind of use this. Now, okay, so one, it's worth mentioning the dice. <laughs> I did this at Agile 2017, uh, this talk, totally different group. Totally different theory of mine. These are scrum masters. Scrum masters are people too. But um, I went through TSA with a bag of these 55 millimeter D20s, which look like, they just look like explosives, right? I mean, it just looks like some kind of futuristic grenade. Um, and the TSA lady's like, you know, she pulls this off and you know, pulls my bag and opens it. It's like, what the hell are these? And I'm like, oh, they're, they're dice for a workshop. And she's like, just go, you know, like, you, you, nothing about what you do is necessary. <laughs> I'm like, well, oh, I've heard that before. All right, so, um, so we kind of, I, I, I use this in a workshop to generate and like give people some empathy. You guys don't need this because you actually do software, so you have like, you know, mechanical sympathy for, for this stuff. Um, but white, you know, we're looking at kind of the world of the undead, right? Very topical. I think the ending was bullshit. I wish the writing were better. Anyway, I live in Atlanta. Got a shout out Walking Dead. Um, but white, I kind of look at like, and, and I'll just say, I used to classify debt as architectural design implementation, which is fairly handy dry way to classify it. But now I'm thinking it more in terms of what are the t kinds of things that hold us back? What are the kinds of things that make us feel crappy about showing up to work? What are the kinds of things that are kind of, um, that we are worthy of investigation? So white, antiquated technology, this is where your app equals to framework. I was talking to my friend Dan, he was saying, we've got this code base, it's all in web forms, and you have to go inspect a bunch of properties, find out where the stuff is, I'm paraphrasing, but more or less it's like, grep rama grep and scratch for factor until you figure out what the hell's happening. And that's like, that wears you down after a while, right? It's really, you know, but then there's a paycheck. So, you know, it's a balance. Um, this is kind of the notion of, you know, mad duplication. Tons of duplication everywhere. It's kind of, you make a change and you forgot it. And regression testing, you know, they're shipping bugs back. This is a kind of endless, tedious experience. So think about fighting walkers, right? It's just like, I stopped watching The Walking Dead after four or five seasons because I'm like, this is just depressing. Like, nothing is ever going to happen. I mean, Spoiler alert, it's depressing, right? So <laughs> dealing with black, black is kind of um, the world of insane complexity. We're in the world of kind of HP Lovecraft. Now I'll share this with you. 
don't recommend you do this. This is, I think I've made a lot of improvement in, as a human being in the last five or six years. But there's one particular, um, let me play this to see if it helps. XML version 1.0 and totally UTF-8. Profile systems table keys value. SK Context Manager Scope Context Asset Context Member Context Custom List Context Toy Value Asset Type Minus 5001 Context Manager Grid Layout Value Number so, Name Column Value This goes on for 8 hours! Okay? This is an 8 hour MP3! This is, to me is the very definition of insanity! Right? This, these people, this is talking about cohesion. These people, which I was part of, anyway, sorry. Yeah, it will drive you mad, right? But I just made this as a point. So what all I did was I took this massive XML file and I piped it to say minus V cello, which is a say is a utility in, um, in Darwin. And then I piped it to FFmpeg or whatever, so it became an MPEG. And it's eight hours long. So if you edit this, and it's interesting to think about a XML file in terms of hours long if sang by a robot cello. Um, <laughs> but if you were to take this um, file and rearrange a little bit, what should be an agile planning tool, so the same team that you're seeing with Gore's different product, same, same, same tribe, um, if you were to take this, rearrange XML, you could very easily create a zookeeping application. Right? So this is extreme cleverness run amok, cleverness and cohesion being very problematic because there was no concept of, like, in an agile planning tool, what are some of the things you would expect to find? Iteration, maybe, sprint, maybe, I don't know, call it what you want, story, perhaps, defect. You know, maybe a test, God, you know, ideally a test, right? But no, it's all spread over a million, million different places. So this is kind of what I would call an intervention. I think it's on the edge of politeness, you know, to do this to a team, but that team needed <laughs> definitely an intervention about this stuff. So, you know, I kind of go back and forth whether or not that's manipulative or influential or whatever, but um, this is kind of one of the areas of debt. It's like confusing, mysterious. What would happen if that, those C++ programmers that made this engine did, that would conspire to create an application in the runtime, right? Very clever. I mean, I've been down that path as a young programmer, right? But um, what would happen if those people left? Luckily, they're highly compensated employees. But stuff happens. Like, what would happen if those people were disabled, you know, or not able to perform their job anymore? Okay, another kind of debt. Now we're firmly in the classic realm of J.R.R. Tolkien, or, you know, just straight up Dungeons and Dragons, right? This type of debt, to me, is the easiest to attack because you know it's there. It's very easy to determine where that debt is. Think about a dragon. A dragon is being a jerk to the land, right? You know. <laughs> Like, the best thing you could do is maybe, like, dig a bowl of sheep, right? Dig a bowl out of, out of the land, fill it full of sheep, and kind of keep the dragon occupied there. But you know you've got one kind of big bad that's screwing things up. This is a hot spot. There'd be dragons. This is solvable. I think it's solvable if your team doesn't have the skills, uh, which are kind of we'll talk about in a second. Um, you need a specialist, right? You need someone probably from the outside. I'm available for hire. Um, but, or you need to have someone senior kind of come in and look at that and, you know, um, there's a special set of tools. Or you need just to run. You just be like, look, there's the dragon. Let's put a fence around it. Let's put our, let's put our earthen sheep bull there so it doesn't attack the village. Let, we have to have a strategy, and that strategy might be just kind of don't go there, there be dragons, or send a dragon slayer. Right. Okay. So these are the themes. And I like these kind of themes to get people started talking about um, what kind of debt they have or what kind of legacy code they're dealing with. Rather than architectural design implementation, that invites a lot of ambiguity in debt. This is more of a storytelling approach to saying, what about what you're doing is kind of difficult or uh, you would like to see improved or you think would make a difference to time to market, net profit, ROI? Okay. It's also fun to have a room full of 100 people throwing these giant 55 millimeter D20s. It's like creates this chaotic moment. Although 
you know, could be weaponized pretty easily. So form a party. Um, this is not one of those talks where there are two types of people in the world. <laughs> what I'm trying to present here, um, thank you. What I'm trying to present here is that you tend to skew one way or the other, right? You tend to be a little bit more kind of a, the wizard disposition or the warrior disposition. And I think this is kind of going into like what kind of people are working, you know, what are, the, what are their mores, what are their, in, you know, kind of um, dispositions, right? So wizards kind of channeling energy from one place to another. Um, you know, they can be kind of mysterious, cryptic. I think it's short, a wizard type is studious and learned, love knowing and invention, can be somewhat cryptic or arcane, um, and they tend to think and act, right? A uh, <laughs> warrior typified by their kind of armor and their tooling, uh, maybe a spirit of vengeance, very motivated, very principled. Um, I've seen a few warriors uh, speaking already. Um, <laughs> warriors have an execution bias. Uh, they love action, they love experience. For them, the heat is the action. Um, hack and slash, they love to jump in, kind of tackle the monster. And they tend to do, 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 and then at best, you know, ideally kind of reflect. So I tend to be a little bit toward that end, a little more execution bias. Um, I think, you know, thinking about a tackling debt, you need to kind of figure out what kind of legacy code debt you have and who can kind of benefit from it. What I re don't recommend is inviting, <laughs> I don't know that we have time to play this out. Sorry, you know this one, right? All down with AOE. Um, I will use intimidating shout to kind of scatter them so we don't have to fight a whole bunch of them at once. Uh, when my shout's done, uh, I'll need Anthony to come in and drop his shout too, uh, so we can keep them scattered and not to fight too many. Um, when his is done, Bass, of course, will need to run in and do the same thing. Uh, we're going to need divine intervention on our mages, uh, so they can uh, AE, uh, so we can, of course, get them down fast, because we're bringing all these guys. I mean, we'll be in trouble if we don't take them down quick. Uh, I think it's a pretty good plan, and we should be able to pull it off this time. Uh, what do you think, Abdul? Can you give me a number crunch real quick? Uh, yeah, give me a sec. I'm coming up with 32.33, uh, repeating, of course, percentage of survival. Oh, that's a lot better than we usually do. Uh, All right, thumbs up. Ready, guys? Let's do this. Leroy Jenkins! Oh, my God, he just ran in. Save him. Oh, jeez, stick it clean. Oh, Jesus. No. So, you know, choice expletives, etc., etc. So all those people, you know... We're thinking about their mission to collect whatever they're collecting all day long. We're going to do this. And Leroy, and now this is stage. I, I've learned since it's stage. But it, you know, I think kind of goes to show like the whole heroism thing with Legacy Code doesn't really work. I think that heroism generally kind of leads you toward more Legacy Code conditions <laughs> than going back and kind of you know, being a valid strategy to getting you away from it. So I think inv inviting people from different perspectives can be valid. So what I'm suggesting is that legacy code, if you're going to go pay back something specific, some kind of debt item, do it as a pair, do it as a mob, right? Okay. So refactoring, I'm going to blaze through this because I'm running Resharper, love it. It's amazing. Resharper is like one of those things that if once you get access to the code, if it's like, uh, or IntelliJ, um, and you're able to provisionally use this, it's a shortcut to credibility. Like it really does make people be like, oh, I want to learn how to do that, right? So it's kind of an influence thing. Um, this is uh, Karievsky's refactoring uh, to patterns based on code smells. I just want to throw that in there. Uh, you can look at it later. Again, refactoring combinations. So <clears throat> Mikado method, is anyone? So this is a really interesting way to do large scale refactorings, right? So the notion is, I'll just come down here and point because I forgot my that you start with, I want to, you know, maybe encapsulate the file DB to be able to switch a database because I want to have like an in-memory database for testing to make tests go faster. So you just do it. You go and you do it. And you control shift B, you compile, and you see what breaks. And then what, based on what breaks, you kind of start building this directed to silic graph. Okay? So every time you have something break, you do a git reset. You go back to a known good point, and you Take a whiteboard as a group, and you say, here's the goal, double circle. Let's do a scratch refactoring, try it, see what broke. Oh, we've got to do this next. And you get to these edges where it just works, right? 
get reset. So now you're back to your original code base, your original goal, and then you work from the edge inward. Got you. It's going to go five minutes late. I'm just going to warn you that right now. So you go from the edge inward, and then you kind of commit. You can commit at any point where you have a safety, right? So this is a large-scale refactoring approach. And again, this works as a party. This is a great thing to do with a mob or a couple people, and it's a great way to show visibility to your team. Talk briefly about Lauren documentation. Codescene.io, I'm absolutely in love with this tool. I think it dudes Adam Tornhill who created this, but the link's there. You can um, point it at any, I think it supports Git, SVN. It supports a number of version control systems. But again, this is a tool that tells you where you have hotspots uh, in a number of ways. So what we're looking at here is social knowledge. We're looking at types that if someone were to be removed from the team, we would, ha remove, we would not necessarily know the design intent of what they had been working on, right? And the way you do this, I redacted their email addresses after failing on that one, but you have everyone that's ever committed to this, and you can configure them as an ex-author. So we'll pick on Jorg in this case. Jorg. Um, we're going to configure as an ex-author, and boom. We see one of the core classes of the system, this black dot. Jorg is the only person that's ever committed to that. Now, you could find this with get blame class to class, but this gives you kind of a large analysis of you know, what's happening. You can start to understand where are, the kind of, where are the silos, the knowledge silos in your code base. Metrics, much aligned. All model, models are wrong. Some are useful. Um, I'll just share one little brief riff on a metric uh, thing. I like the notion of coupling metrics, afferent and efferent, but in a specific way, and I like to combine them with code coverage. So efferent coupling is fan out, outbound dependencies, right? So these are my, I'm, I'm a class, I depend on these classes. Afferent is, here, I'm a class, you use me to do something, right? I'm reused. Instability, efferent over the, pro, uh, the sum of efferent and afferent, this is Uncle Bob Martin, he has some good ideas and some bad ones. <laughs> um, so instability, we can look at very simply, if we have a component X that serves a single consumer, um, it's an afferent dependent. Uh, inside component X, there are calls to components A, B, C, D, E, and F, right? So our instability here is fairly high. That, what I'm saying is that A through F, if, they throw in, if one of those decides to throw a new exception, if they change their interface, you know, we have now instability in the downstream component X. So we have an instability of 0.86. So what I'm suggesting is Endepend, um, SonarCube, tools like that help you measure this in your types. I would suggest that having 100% coverage over a type like that, which is, you know, these tend to be like controllers. These tend to be like application services. These tend to be model controllers, those kinds of things, is a bit of a waste of time because now you're in the business of maintaining tests, right? Especially when I'm going into a team where I'm doing test fortification, they have no tests, or their tests are so old, I know I'm running over time now, um, that they uh, want to fortify their code base with some tests. I'm like, let's not bother with that. Let's bother with the stuff that are like the entities the value objects, the aggregate uh, roots of the world. Um, I like to also kind of when I'm running through a mission is put some sensible metrics in play. Um, basically a lightweight dashboard that tells us whether or not where we got to and whether or not that practice is sticking, right? Is the effect, um, is it a one-time effect? Think about the jagged tooth of uh, improvement. I'm going to breeze through that. So lastly, adventure. Um, you know, we're running out of time, but I like to kind of frame the work. What I'm doing with teams now is this business here with goals and success measures, technical goals, sometimes they're technical debt payback. So what I'm trying to do is find a way to balance teams out to say, um, do, are we kind of not just pursuing business goals like top line, uh, bottom line growth, income statement stuff, product goals like delighting the user, making it more uh, joyful experience, but are we pursuing technical goals that make our code more sustainable? The notion here is that this, whatever this team is working on, they're working on it together, and they're working on a balanced set of things, 
right? Not, not just going after a particular um, technical, not just like a week of tech data, right? So aligning, balancing goals. One thing I'll say is scaling ambition, uh, uh, sc sc around scaling ambition and capability. You know, we kind of think of like, um, I'm just gonna let this play. When you have a larger technical debt thing, like that 15,000 line class, you're looking for deeper mapping. You're looking to really understand what is the extent of separating that class out? What would that cost? And that's what I did. It produced a kind of a cost benefit of this approach, right? We didn't actually, they canceled the program before I left, right? I was able to get like an in-memory uh, database persistence thing going so they could write tests or the tests ran, but they just decided to chuck the whole thing. Smaller kind of efforts, sweeping and cleaning, those are kind of where your refactoring uh, um, skills lie. So matching skill to adventure, this is simply saying who's going to kind of be on this adventure, what skills do we need to accomplish that. The X, I use this kind of method where X is like, I've got it, I've got an unlock, I feel pretty comfortable with it. O is I would like to acquire that skill and blank is conspicuously absent. Either I don't want you knowing I have that skill, I'm over it, or don't care. So this particular team is gonna have a problem with BI because there's only one person that wants it. For what? This team has a rather high opinion of themselves. <laughs> it's nice though because it was like, I think it was um, gay pride. So they, and they kind of embrace that notion. So that's kind of. <laughs> Lastly, uh, so not lastly, but I'm, I'm close, and then we can go to lunch. I'm sure it'll be delicious. But, um, you know, little Silicon Valley shout out, but failure does sometimes equal success. These missions don't always end in success, right? There are times where you'll face an opponent that uh, is just beyond your means, right? But at least you know that, right? You know that maybe we can pick a different strategy. We can hedge that off. That technical debt, let's build a nice veneer over it so we don't have to deal with it as much and let it kind of just be its you know, normal TM itself. So lastly, retelling the story and this kind of ending, we're close, I promise. But you know, I'm looking at loops. I'm looking at saying, how do we kind of do this over and over again? How do we take the learnings from trying to tackle some kind of technical debt or fix some legacy code and feed the forward into what we're doing. This is a kind of a loop I put in place for a large DevOps transformation. Your loops may vary. I think being precious about the loops is kind of problematic, you know? Kind of build your loop to the kind of environment that you have. If you have a lot of legacy code, be prepared to kind of bend the normal agile de rigueur kind of scrum template. So continuous adventuring rather than this. I don't think it has to be a zero-sum game. This is kind of my mental model. Again, don't come in with the RPG stuff to a serious work situation. That's just meant to make it a little bit more fun, a little find some eye candy. I think here's a kind of sneaky turn, and this is, I promise, the last second to last slide. But you need to have some kind of ideal in mind, right? And for me, this is hexagonal architecture. This is the stuff that um, uh, the primary and secondary work of domain-driven design and what's happened in the last intervening decade, of at least when I picked it up, right? It's amazing to see that the thing's like 15 years old now. And there's a community. That doesn't happen that often, right? So, that I, but I try to treat that sensible default. I try to hold that inside. I try to kind of use that as my lens and let the story emerge before I rush to judgment. And I think that kind of helps with the influence, so. I want to thank you all for coming to my talk and not Jimmy Bogard's. Um, there were some technical issues and I know we went a little bit over time. I've got a couple of sec, you know, do I have time for questions or? Okay, all right. It's 130 slides, it's pretty good, right? 50 minutes. <laughs> well, I forgot my clicker because I moved last weekend so everything's in boxes, but um, yeah. That was really good, thanks. Um, do you ever have situations where you go in and do this kind of analysis and literally say the only solution is to run as fast as we can? Yeah, like, sure. It's that bad. But, okay, so that 15,000 line class thing that kind of hyped up in the abstract, that was a two week engagement, the 10 days over a month, right? And in that time, we did all that, you know, pulled a lot of that kind of sampling. So these are from different clients, but more or less that same approach. Built a deck to kind of say to me, and I, and, I, and I peer review it with engineering and management. 
Like, I, my, one of my goals is to not be a Bob and not be like that spooky guy, right? One of my goals is to be like, look, together, let's figure out what the shared meaning is. In that case, I gave them all kinds of options. I'm like, option one, chuck it. Option two, live with it. Option three, fix it. That means another, that means two weeks of my time, whatever it costs. That means two weeks uh, for a pair of developers that's opportunity costs on their side. And they decided it wasn't worth it. They decided to huck it. Now, I did a lot of spiking on that class. I was able to kind of, you know, like it had like getters that you'd, so once you access the getter, that whole blob would come back into play. But the upside of that code base was there was actually a class called work order. And there was, you know, the naming, you could find things, you could reason about the code base, but once you got into a method, it got a little hairy. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I'm just there to kind of facilitate as objective a conversation about what to do with the system that's approaching crisis and to sometimes play devil's advocate and say, look, you know, do we really need to do anything with this? Is it fine? Can we build like a little bit of a boundary and start to build like um, a more hexagonal piece within this large monolithic big ball of mud? So I mean, this is like I'm a consultant, so I say it, it depends a lot, you know. But but it, the relativism is, I think, just kind of getting, bringing them to the table and make the choice. That's really, you know. Uh, and then I'll give them my advice. But but I mean, that's at the that comes at the end. Questions? Solved. Solved problem. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, David.